Well, good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. The theory that Russia won the November election for Donald Trump through some vague meddling so dominates cable news right now that it's worth summing up exactly what we know and what we don't know about that story. As of today, there is no evidence that the Russian government tampered with voting machines or hacked any votes in November. There is no evidence that Russia collaborated with Donald Trump or his campaign to win the election. There is no evidence that Russian propaganda swung a single vote away from Hillary Clinton. There is, in other words, no reason to believe that Russia changed the course of American political history. There is merely innuendo and conspiracy mongering and connecting probably irrelevant dots. Lee Harvey Oswald spent time in Mexico City? Okay. But what does that mean exactly? Nothing significant that we know of. So why does this story persist, indeed grow by the day? One reason is that organizations like NBC News, and particularly its cable outlet, MSNBC, have gone to remarkable lengths to keep it alive. Ever see their programming? It's hour upon hour of segments like this. Rachel Maddow continues to investigate the Trump-Russia connection, exposing new details. The Trump campaign didn't just benefit from Russia interfering in our presidential campaign. The point of this is they colluded, they helped, they were in on it. The reporting shows a disturbing pattern of rolling disclosure among the president's inner circle when it comes to their contacts with Russia. Because of Russian interference in our election. I have to say tantalizing evidence of some kind of collusion continuing influence in our country, not just during the campaign, but during the administration. Basically signs of what could be a continuing operation. Well, it turns out there's more than a little irony here. Complaints from NBC about election meddling? Given that company's conduct over the past six months, that is a bit rich. Consider the infamous Access Hollywood tape. Now, if you were living in America last fall, you certainly remember it, the shocking and vulgar remarks, the immediate and disastrous effect that tape had on candidate Trump's poll numbers. It was a political bomb detonated in the final days of the most intense political race of our lifetimes. The fallout was so overwhelming that few paused to consider where that tape came from. So let's consider that now. That tape belonged to NBC. It was shot by NBC cameramen for an NBC show on NBC property. So how did it wind up in the hands of the Washington Post, which broke the story? How, in other words, did valuable intellectual property from one news organization end up benefiting a competitor? Intentionally, that's the short answer. According to sources at NBC, the Access Hollywood tape was leaked to the Washington Post with the full knowledge of NBC brass. That would include news division head Andrew Lack. NBC's motive? To derail the Trump campaign two days before a presidential debate. Now, keep in mind that the Access Hollywood tape had been sitting in an archive since it was shot 11 years before. NBC executives had known about its existence since at least last summer, months before it aired. Concerned about being accused of partisanship and perhaps worried about California's strict wiretapping law, which prohibits the recording of subjects without their knowledge, the network sat on it. But as November approached, the temptation to shut down the Trump campaign became too much. And so NBC rose the defense of Hillary Clinton and leaked that tape. And then they lied about it. Now, if you're a news organization and someone stole the story of the year out of your office, wouldn't you want to know how that happened? You'd think you would. And yet, as far as we can tell, NBC News has never conducted a meaningful internal investigation into how that tape wound up at the Washington Post. That's because they already knew the identity of the leaker. It was them. Now, all of this is more or less common knowledge, or at least commonly suspected in the tiny world of the TV news business. As we said, Andrew Lack knew about it. So apparently did today's show anchor Matt Lauer. And yet until now, nobody bothered to tell the public. We're doing that. By the way, we asked Lauer and Lack and the NBC PR department for their response to all of this earlier today. They declined comment. Still, the obvious question hangs in the air since we've been talking so much lately about election tampering, and it's this. What do you think played a bigger role in the 2016 race? The Access Hollywood tape or the Russian government? That's an obvious one. Just because NBC's effort failed and Donald Trump won anyway doesn't mean it's irrelevant. NBC News lied to the public to help destroy a politician they didn't like. We know that. We know they wouldn't do it again, do we? Do we know they're not doing it now? Unfortunately, we don't know that. And now to a Fox News alert. The hits keep coming. NBC at it again. This time their cable outlet has reported what it says is President Trump's tax returns from the year 2005. The White House has responded tonight. Trace Gallagher is here with the details. Hey, Trace. 
And we're kind of watching Rachel Maddow as she goes on here, Tucker. And what we're learning is that she so far has revealed very little, if anything, about these taxes, saying that they were uncovered by an investigative reporter um, and that, in fact, the, the big mystery here is how these things surfaced in the first place. And maybe that would lead to further avenues of reporting. We know, as you said, the taxes are from 2005. That's the year that Donald Trump married Melania. And that's the year he shut down his controversial Trump University. It was also his second year on The Apprentice on NBC. The White House tonight responded to MSNBC saying that in 2005, Donald Trump paid $38 million in taxes on $150 million in income and that he paid no more than he was legally required. Now, the White House went on to say, and we're quoting here, you know you are desperate, referring to MSNBC, you know you are desperate for ratings when you are willing to violate the law to push a story about two pages of tax returns from over a decade ago. Of course, income wouldn't be the big revelation here, considering that we know in 1995, Mr. Trump declared a $916 million loss, which would have allowed him to legally avoid paying any taxes for up to 18 years. Also on the show, we expect in the next few minutes will be this Trump biographer and investigative journalist David K. Johnston, who is the one who apparently obtained these tax returns. He was billed as also being a financial and tax expert reporter. Last year, Johnston is also the one you may recall who asked the New York Attorney General to investigate Trump's charitable foundation as well as his tax returns. What journalists have been actively looking for in any of these tax returns or documents is any financial ties, particularly suspect financial ties, maybe even to Russia. Donald Trump has maintained the only ones interested in his tax returns are reporters and that he would not release his returns while he's being audited. The IRS, we should note, has said that an audit does not prevent someone from releasing tax documents. The White House goes on to say it is totally illegal to publish tax returns and is bashing the, quote, dishonest media. We are continuing to monitor anything that might come out of these two pages of tax returns from 2005. So far, very little has been revealed. Tucker. Thanks a lot, Trace. We're joined now by our colleague, Kimberly Guilfoyle. She is also an attorney. Kimberly, there's a lot about this story we don't know. It's unfolding uh, even as we speak. But the White House somehow had foreknowledge of this uh, before it aired. It's airing right now on another channel. How do you think, wh where did this come from? What's the backstory? Any idea? Well, I was listening in my other ear to uh, Rachel Maddon to her program. Um, and basically she said there was a subject of an, an investigation, investigated reporter provided this information. As an attorney, I will tell you that I would begin to question right away the legality of this, how they were able to obtain this. And clearly this is another uh, political move to try to discredit the presidency of Donald Trump. So it comes as no surprise to anybody that politics is at play here. Um, Trace is uh, right. And he said in his reporting to you that, in fact, uh, there was some kind of nefarious uh, relationship, is what Rachel Maddow is saying, between Donald Trump and a Russian oligarch that purchased a home for $100 million. And she said, why was there all of a sudden this windfall of an additional $60 million more than the house was originally worth at $40 million? So trying to say, again, to tie into the Russian narrative that there's some kind mm. of untoward conduct, that perhaps that should be looked at. Because other than that, what you see is that Donald Trump is a very wealthy man. Shocking. Donald Trump paid a lot of money in taxes, some $38 million in taxes that year. So what else is there to say that's really that shocking or revealing? She has a couple pages of it, so she's going through that. And again, it's primarily focusing on what was this real estate transaction, and that was the last thing that she was um, talking about and trying to right. make some kind of connection there, some nexus, and then, of course, tying in. And she even mentioned Wilbur Ross and past jobs that he's had, trying to tie it into the Trump administration. Right. Who was seen, I think, on the grassy knoll. Um, if, if anything, this sort of <laughs> highlights the need for tax reform. So 38 million on 150, if legal, and they're saying it is, no one's alleging otherwise, is a much lower rate than I pay. Uh, so there's that. 
And but he has suggested, big... in fact, tax reforms right. um, himself, you know, in terms of saying what people should be able to pay, et cetera. So to me, I'm not sure. I mean, perhaps they're going to get to more on the story here. Right. But obviously, yes, this is an attempt at a, a ratings grab, an attempt also to try to, again, like, poke the cage politically and, you know, stir the pot as it relates to the Russian relationship, which you've seen that really heavily covered by the mainstream media, you know, almost every single day to the point of uh, exhaustion. And uh, that's what we're seeing right now again. So to me, so far, legally, there doesn't appear to be any impropriety whatsoever as it relates to the return, which was properly filed based on the tax laws at the time. Right. Was it properly obtained, though? That's the question. I well, think most of us file our taxes issue. and imagine their kind of private information, sacrosanct, actually. So how Absolutely. would something like this become So she's public? saying that somebody has turned this over to them or to the powers that be at uh, MSNBC or to her team. She's an investigative uh, journalism. But somebody should get to the bottom of this because the IRS or other people, this is just, again, more of a story we've been covering, which is leaks. More leaks. Who, in fact, would turn over this private and confidential privilege information? Right. Uh, they're doing so at their own peril because if you find out who did this, there could be serious, uh, you know, legality issues here. And also, I'd be concerned, you know, as a journalist, if you proffer this information and essentially publish somebody's tax returns and their private information. Yeah, I mean, what, what's ironic, of course, is I think a lot of people in the press assumed that President Trump had paid nothing in taxes. Mm-hmm. That was certainly the allegation. And he didn't really deny it, actually, during the campaign. Here you have him paying $38 million on 150. Mm-hmm. Well, final question, is there any scenario that you can think of where a tax return might be public other than if it was released by the person who filed it? Yeah, other than somebody filing it themselves, no. And But she doesn't have the complete return. So right. there's just a couple pages that she's focusing in on, I believe, like the 1040 statement. So, yeah. you know, we'll have to see what the rest of the reporting on it, uh, you know, reveals. But right now, the main, the headline, the thrust of it was Russia real estate, oligarch, like, you know, buzzwords that they're using to try to demonize and scare everyone. Um, They like to throw out the oligarch thing because that, like, makes everybody (laughs) shock and awe. (laughs) Russia. Right? Russia. KG, it's great to see you tonight. Thank you for that. Just don't say KGB. (laughs) I will not say KGB. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) Well, we're joined now by Joe Concha, who writes about media for The Hill newspaper here in Washington. So, Joe, great to, uh, great to see you. We opened the show tonight with a story that I think is significant. Um, there, it's come to our attention, and it's true, that NBC uh, Brass, the people who run it, Andy Lack, who runs the news division, um, knew that the famous Access Hollywood tape was being leaked to the Washington Post, that it was done intentionally mm. um, because they want to distance themselves from it, but they wanted to hurt Trump before the presidential uh, debate two days later. Does that come as a shock to you who covers television? Well, first I have to push back a little bit. We don't know definitively that Angie Lack had knowledge of that. I, I understand that it's scuttlebutt within our bubble, but we don't have a definitive report or confirmation I, I, on I, that. I, I can say that definitively, yes. Okay, you could that say that. I, I, yes. I'm hesitant to do that. Right. Um, look, I, I would think that given that that tape Access Hollywood, bombshell revelations, would right. not only changed the presidential election, but the entire course of the country forever. Think of Trump, Clinton, the different agendas, Supreme right. Court justice, you go down the line, it, it is huge. And I would think, I get it's 11 years later and you gotta connect a lot of dots and go back, but you at least try, and you at least try to do an internal investigation to figure out where that tape went, because I'm sure that more than a couple of people know exactly what happened there and you at least make the effort. But from what I can tell, that effort hasn't been made or it hasn't been made public that it's been made. And I would think if they did, make an investigation, they would make that known to the well, public. Well, and we, and we asked them today that exact question. What, where's your internal investigation? And they refused comment. I mean, look, if someone stole the biggest news story of the year out of your office, mm-hmm. you might want to find out how that happened. But the bigger, if you take three steps back, story is this. Here, a news organization had this tape, and no one's claiming the tape wasn't real. President Trump said what he said on the tape. Sure. I'm not defending it. But that was their intellectual property. They owned it, and yet they surreptitiously fed it to another news organization. Can you think of any precedent for that? Have you ever seen anything like that or heard of anything like that ever? No, I've never seen that actually happen, Tucker. Uh, but you know, I, I'm sure that NBC News would have wanted their hands on it first and how it got to the Washington Post. Uh, again, that's what investigations are for, and that's why you conduct them. Uh, but you know, this is how things are now in news, Tucker, in terms of reporters 
asking people to commit illegal acts and leak information. Nicholas Kristof, and I asked your producers right before I came on, can you put together this tweet real quick that he put out last week? Nicholas Kristof won Pulitzer's at the New York Times, and he actually solicited information on Twitter saying, please send Donald Trump's tax returns. There it is on screen. Here's the New York Times address. And he asked the IRS to do that, an employee there. You know what that is, Tucker, when you actually steal and leak that kind of information? If you're an employee, right. a federal employee, it's a felony. And you have journalists asking regular people to commit felonies in order to advance a story, a narrative. It's sick. And the New York Times executive editor, Dean Paquet, also said last year he was willing to go to jail for five years if he could get Trump's tax return. So he is setting the example at the paper of record that illegal acts and leaks should happen if we can get the story. And that is the sad state of journalism in 2017. Well, and not just journalism. I mean, speaking for myself, I always want more information, almost no matter where, you know, if Satan handed me relevant information, I'd run with it because it's the information that matters. What I'm struck by and frightened by is the idea that federal employees who have so much of our information, intimate information, and they safeguard it, supposedly, we pay them to do that, would be leaking in order to hurt people they disagree with politically. That's scary from behind a cloak of anonymity. I mean, that's when you get government trying to destroy people on the basis of difference of belief. I mean, that I can't imagine anything scarier than that. No, it, it should be very alarming for, for everybody out there. And with this uh, report on MSNBC tonight as far as the 2005 tax returns, the real story I can see so far is that those got leaked by somebody, not what's in them, as far as I can tell, unless they're saving it for the end of the show. And that's what should be the lead story tomorrow, not what's in them. And I'm, I'll, I'll be very curious to see exactly what the New York Times and Washington Post and all of traditional media lead with in this situation. Well, I mean, and sort of bring it back to the, to the first story very quickly. So the Access Hollywood tape breaks end of the first week of October, right before that uh, debate. October 7th, yeah. Uh, exactly, in St. Louis. And in, in the kerfuffle over it, I didn't hear anybody ask the obvious question of NBC, which is, hey, this is your tape. You've had it for 11 years. You knew it existed. How did the Washington Post get it? Why did nobody ask that obvious question of a news organization? Because everybody loved the narrative. Everybody right. saw that as the end of Donald Trump, and that blotted out the sun, and no one bothered to say, hey, where did that come from, by the way? So, look, this happened once before, by the way, and I know you got to go soon. 2004, remember what happened with Dan Rather, and he does that report on George yeah. W. Bush and his, and his guard service, and it was based on forged documents. CBS at least did an internal investigation, and they had accountability shown there as Dan Rather was shown the door. And that's what you got to do in these situations. Find where the leak is and show that you care. That's all I ask. It's just what's interesting to me that news executives are so partisan or feel it their mission to destroy a politician. And this is not a defense of any specific politician, only a defense of traditional journalism where you're not partisan, that they would feel that so overwhelmingly that they would give up a big story, that they would hurt one of their own employees because they're that committed to the cause of getting a specific person elected. Like that's the behavior of a political consultant, not of a news division chief. Let's put it this way, Tucker. Jorge Ramos won a Walter Cronkite award yesterday. Jorge Ramos is a known advocate. He is not an anchor, That's right. but he has a mission. And the mission is to take down Donald Trump at every chance he can. So then the people behind the Walter Cronkite Award, which is obviously a, an iconic name in this business. And they say, we're gonna give it to Jorge Ramos because not because he's doing good journalism, because we agree with the message. And that's the state of journalism today where it's all about the narrative and not about the responsibilities that we're supposed to have, which is to be objective. Here's what Ramos said last year. He said neutrality is not an option when it comes to Donald right. Trump, and he gets a Walter Cronkite Award. Right, and the, and the problem is not that they have opinions. I have tons of opinions. The problem is you're not an if anchor. you're so emotionally engaged in a story mm -hmm. that you can't see it clearly, you should not be covering it. If you feel, if you're waking up in the middle of the night in rage over something, whoa, back off a little bit, and these people aren't. Will you stay right there for a second? I want you to react to this. This here is the full statement from a senior administration official about tonight and about those tax returns from 2005, we're quoting now. Okay. You know you are desperate for ratings when you're willing to violate the law to push a story about two pages of tax returns from over a decade ago. Before being elected president, Mr. Trump was one of the most successful businessmen in the world with a responsibility to his company, his family, and his employees to pay no more tax than legally required. That being said, Mr. Trump paid $38 million even after taking into account large-scale depreciation for construction on an income of more than $150 million, 
as well as paying tens of millions of dollars in other taxes, such as sales and excise taxes and employment taxes. And this illegally published return proves just that. Despite the substantial income figure in tax paid, it is totally illegal to steal and publish tax returns. The dishonest media can continue to make this part of their agenda, while the president will focus on his, which includes tax reform that will benefit all Americans. So there you have it. Note the Joe irony Conscious. is there, Tucker, from what I can see so far, unless, again, they're saving something for the end of that show in terms of what they're going to reveal. This is a boomerang effect. And it's supposed to be something, an object thrown at Donald Trump to hurt him. And instead, it's going to come right back. And this will hurt media and the people against Trump even further, because this, as far as I can tell, is a nothing burger. Unless there's something else there that I'm missing, this is going to have the same boomerang effect that his 95 tax returns had during the election, where everybody said, see, Donald Trump, you didn't pay a lot of taxes. And Trump actually turned it, I think, into a positive, where he said, yeah, I know the tax system. I didn't pay what I didn't have to pay. And people were almost applauding, like, yeah, I would do the same thing. So that's the effect I think seeing here. When you try too hard to go after somebody, it's a boomerang effect. You end up hurting yourself. Yeah, it makes me anxious for tax reform. Under 30 percent, I look on in envy uh, as accountants. But, you know, it's more than zero, which is what a lot of people thought. Joe, thanks a lot for this. I appreciate thanks, it. Thanks, Tucker. We're going to stay on top of this breaking story throughout the hour. Up next, more leaks, why there are constant leaks from our intelligence agencies, and there are. Some say they're putting our national security at risk. We will speak to one former CI officer who quit rather than work for President Trump. He joins us in just a moment. Well, a series of pages from Donald Trump's 2005 federal tax return have been leaked somehow, uh, and we're getting details now about what is in them and what is not in them. Uh, for those, we're going to go to Trace Gallagher, who's standing by. Trace? Yeah, to, to say it gently, Rachel Maddow is struggling to give us some information, Tucker. She's got the two pages of the 2005 tax return. She just read the numbers, which we have said again and again here. $150 million of income in 2005. Mr. Trump apparently wrote down $103 million, and overall he paid $38 million in taxes. Remember, we went back to the 1995 uh, tax returns where he took a $916 million loss, which, according to tax experts, would have given him the possibility that he would not have had to pay federal taxes for up to 18 years. So if you want to crunch these numbers, that's the big revelation, that he paid $38 million in taxes on $150 million of income. We've been watching the show now for 19 minutes, and, and what is happening here is there's been a lot of speculation. They talked about possible ties to Russia. There was no evidence provided. Possible ties to Turkey. There was no evidence at all provided. They talked about the U.S. attorneys being fired. Again, no connection between that and the tax returns. And over the course of four or five minutes, she asked a series of questions and again provided no answers, speculating, is it possibly because Trump didn't pay enough in taxes, didn't make as much money as we thought he made, didn't make enough donations as everybody has thought he made? Bunch of speculative questions, very little in the form of answers. We're still walking, watching again this investigative journalist um, who apparently obtained these tax returns. We've now learned they were actually put inside his mailbox at some point in time. That's how he got them. They were sent over to MSNBC. MSNBC sent them to the White House, and we gave you the White House's response was that Mr. Trump paid his $38 million. He did not pay any more than he was legally obliged to pay, and they went on uh, to criticize the network for actually illegally obtaining documents for nothing more than ratings. That's a paraphrase, but in essence, that's what the White House said about MSNBC. Big ratings, maybe, but, but as far as information, Tucker, so far, very, very little. Trace Gallagher, watching that on our behalf, and we're grateful that you did. Thanks, Trace. Well, tomorrow we're on the road with the president, leaving here, flying to Detroit. We'll be talking to him. We're going to be asking him uh, questions about those tax returns. We'll bring that to you tomorrow night. Meanwhile, our security agencies are charged with the awesome task of protecting our secrets, preserving the country's 320 million citizens from harm. But ever since the inauguration of the president, that responsibility has been mixed with a lot of leaking government secrets to the press. Ned Price worked for the CIA from 2006 until this past February when he quit rather than serve under President Trump. He says it was not a political decision. He joins us tonight. Uh, Ned Price, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Sir. First, let me say, I, you know, good for you. If you don't think you can work for a president, you should leave. Um, you, you are a Democrat. You work for Democratic campaigns given to Democratic candidates. Fine. You know, I, I, 
I guess what I'm saying is yours is the model I wish others in the federal government would follow since the CIA exists to inform the president not to make its own policy. And yet what you're seeing is people who've stayed behind who are trying to undermine the policies of the president and that's unconstitutional. Well, Tucker, look, I certainly appreciate the compliment, um, but let me just make the point that our intelligence community is not comprised of Republicans or Democrats. They are not comprised of progressives or conservatives. These are people who have signed up to protect the country, to protect the country they love, um, regardless of who is in the Oval Office. I worked proudly under President George W. Bush as a CIA analyst when I first started. I worked proudly under President Barack Obama, whom I later served in the White House. But this is not the intelligence community. It, it is not a shifting sand based on which political party well, and is it, in and power, it nor, nor should it be. It shouldn't be. Right, Look, exactly. I've lived here a long time. It's an enormous federal government. Part of what you said is true. Part of it's not. There are partisans in the government, permanent government, and I know them. So that's that's untrue. But, but I think, but, I think but, most of them... Tucker, that, that's, that, that's the nature of our government, that of course you can have personal political beliefs right. as you do and as I do, but you can still fulfill the function that you are charged with as a public servant, whether it's a but Republican or Democrat. that's not actually the office. point that I'm making. My point is that people who serve in a bunch of different agencies, including CIA, you know, throughout the intel community, have certain views of policy that they are wedded to. And that in this case, and there's been a lot of reporting on this, they believe Trump will undermine their goals, and so they are trying to undermine Trump. And what I'm saying, withholding information from him, for example, and what I'm saying is things fall apart. I don't think there's, a, I don't think there's any evidence happens. of that, first of all. Really? There's, the New York Times reported it. I believe them. I, I think it was the Wall Street Journal that reported that, but I don't think there was any evidence to actually back that up. And, and well, I think that well, the, the, the CIA director and the director of national intelligence has actually come out and said that's not true. Okay. But, 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 but here's what we know. They didn't like Mike Flynn. Fine. But then they destroyed him by leaking and committed a felony in so doing a transcript of his conversation, which was surveilled with the Russian ambassador. They're not allowed to do that. They did it to affect a political end, and we should be worried about that. Let me make the very important point that there is never any justification for the leaking of classified information. It is illegal, and it has the potential to put lives at risk. But there are other important points. Not for just put lives, but destroy a life for political reasons. That's what well, they did. Yeah, exactly. And it, in the case of in intelligence works and work, it has the potential to put sources at risk, sources in the field, people who commit treason against their own country to help the United States. It has the potential to expose them and to you know uh, leave them um, to the will of, of their government. No, it's not just about in, the agents in the field. It's I, about I, me I, and you and anybody else. But here's what bugs me. Look, I appreciate our federal employees, including in the intelligence community. But the idea that you can't criticize them when they've been repeatedly wrong about a lot of big things, I don't know, the fall of the Soviet Union after 50 years of watching, or 9-11, or the WMD in Iraq, the idea that I don't, as a citizen, have a right to criticize them, I'm unpatriotic if I do so, where'd that come from? No one has ever said that intelligence professionals are infallible. Intelligence is not a science, it is an art. It is about putting together a piece of the puzzle, where, uh, uh, an entire puzzle, wearing a blindfold, not knowing how many pieces exist. But you it, said it, that. It, it is an art. No, but you said that. You said NPR. They said NPR, so why'd you yeah. leave? And you said... Trump insulted the intel community, fine, Absolutely. then he said, quote, he accused them of leaking, which they do, and doubted their work. What's wrong with that? There is nothing, Isn't that my there, right? There is nothing wrong with doubt with being skeptical. What, what the point I was making to NPR is that President Trump, who was then the GOP nominee at the time, in the third debate, just casually cast aside the high confidence assessment of all 17 intelligence community agencies that Russia had meddled in our election. He didn't have any proof otherwise. He didn't have any justification for it. He just said he didn't believe it. Well, it could have been a They didn't have any proof either. And by the way, <laughs> all of our, Stansfield Turner, who ran CIA, as you know, for an awfully long time, said when the Soviet Union felt no one there knew this was going to happen. Tucker, is someone... So, like, that's not crazy. Is, is, a consensus is not the truth. As, so, as someone who spent years working on analysis within the CIA, yeah. I, I know that a high-confidence assessment, there is something to that. And a high-confidence assessment that, oh, is, so signed, what, what is, that is signed onto by 17 intelligence communities, uh, agencies, all 17 agencies... Are there really 17? What are the 17 <laughs> intelligence agencies? <laughs> Do you People really? throw that around. I don't know what they are. What are they? <laughs> there's a CIA. There's a DNI. There's a DIA. There's the FBI. There's the NSA. You go on and on and on. No, that's but, five. <laughs> so I mean, I don't know that there are 17 intelligence agencies. Why does everyone say that? I mean, I'm just uh, sincerely. So, okay. I wish someone would, would I, you email I'm, me I'm and sure tell me what I, they are. I can, I can get you a, a full Because every shot. night the guest is like, if, oh, all 17. Really? All what are they? If you want to know all 17 of them, I'm sure we can provide that to you. I hope but, you will. But that's beside the point. The point no, is No, it's the point. <laughs> It's that the point is, look, you're claiming knowledge of something that you haven't produced. If you're going to affect the political process with a claim, I as a citizen have a right to know what the heck you're talking about. They, Tucker, they produced their report. I they, read it. And no, you didn't because it's classified. No, no, I read the public, I read the public exactly. summary of it. Yes. And it didn't tell me anything.
<laughs> well, I'm, I'm sorry that's how you feel, but there, it, both in that January report and then in the October attribution statement on October 7th, the all 17 intelligence community agencies signed on to this okay. statement with high confidence that Russia was behind this. Subsequent to that, in January, they produced a classified assessment and an unclassified assessment that laid out their case in great detail. You certainly read the unclassified yeah. version, but there is a classified okay. version that has data points. Okay. We got to go. We're evidence. out of time. Ned, it's great to see you. All Come right. back. All we'll right. be right back. Well, despite the bold pronouncements of congressional Democrats and, of course, MSNBC, which is hyperventilating even as we speak, here's what we actually know. There's still no evidence that President Trump's campaign was co-opted by Moscow and its agents. But much like a cargo cult builds runways in hopes that cargo planes will land on them, some don't believe it. For example, Congressman Eric Swalwell of California has created an entire web page chronicling Donald Trump's connection to the Russian homeland in hope that evidence Trump is a Russian agent will manifest itself eventually. Congressman Swallow joins us now from Oakland. Congressman, great to see you. You too, Tucker. So um, I, I went to the site, which is actually pretty well done and kind of interesting. Thank you. A little, a little florid, I would say. Uh, but you have this whole section, and I'm quoting now, Russia colon not our friend. And so I wanted to ask you, how far are we willing to go with this, this new Cold War that you guys have started? I mean, where is this going to end up? Do you anticipate a conflict with Russia, a, a military conflict? Have they really hacked our democracy, as you said. Why wouldn't we just attack them? I hope we don't have another conflict with Russia. And I put that section in, Tucker, because a lot of people like me, born in 1980, didn't grow up with uh, the Cold War uh, atrocities. And so I wanted to lay out post-Cold War atrocities, like what Russia has done in Ukraine. They were responsible for bringing down a commercial airliner with 300 souls aboard, yep. like what they are doing in Syria, the human rights violations that they're committing there. So I wanted to lay out for young people that this isn't like having ties with the United Kingdom. This is like having ties with a country with a vast number of human rights uh, violations and a leader uh, who has been, res been named as being responsible for the killing of journalists. So how would it be uh, different from having ties with, I don't know, pick one, Saudi Arabia, one of our closest allies? Uh, truly one of our I'm closest. focused on Russia. That, that takes all no, my no, time no, but, right but, now, Tucker. No, 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 but I'm just wondering, since we're laying down these precedents, look, if a country mistreats journalists or if it's, uh, you know, not observant of basic human rights, I don't know, if being gay is illegal, for example, or they kill people they don't like or they sponsor foreign wars, then we can't be their well, ally, Saudi they're Arabia, not our friend. Saudi Arabia is not very happy with me either because I supported uh, declassifying the 28 pages of the September 11 report uh, that had information about uh, uh, allegations involving Saudi Arabia well, and September that's 11th. That, that's your response to a country that ignores human rights and puts journalists in jail and sows discord through the world to, to no, sponsor I'm legislation to declassify? Right now, okay, uh, I'm just saying, like, what they are the rules us. since you've become this yeah. big neocon along with lots, lots of other Democrats, yeah. a cold warrior, a neoconservative? My, pa my parents would be very happy to hear you say that. Uh, yeah. But it's just... I guess I, I'm just trying to understand what the new rules are here. So for generations, as you know, the left, the Democratic Party, was accused correctly of coddling the Russians back when it was a left-wing country. And now all of a sudden they've come back and said the problem with Republicans is they're not worried enough about the red menace. So I'm just going forward, like, how do I know when a country is, quote, not our friend? Yeah, well, I'm living in the now, and this is a country that is not our friend right now. It's a country who attacked us in the last election, and it's a country where Donald Trump and people on his team have very deep personal, political, and financial ties. And the question that everyone wants answered is, did right. those ties extend to working with the Russians while they were attacking us? And that, I think, calls for an independent commission. Get this out of Congress, take it away from the Trump administration, and let's get to the bottom of what happened. So one of the things you, you allege here, or you really you point out, and I, I think I'm quoting, is that Russia supports the Syrian dictator Bashar al-Assad, which is, of course, entirely true, and you disapprove of that. Who should we be supporting? Who should be in charge of Syria? Since this is the real world, these are actual countries, you're an actual congressman, who should we be supporting in the Syrian civil war? It's not binary. It shouldn't be Assad, and it shouldn't be ISIL. And I think so who? removing both of them from Syria would be a good thing. So nobody's in charge. It's just chaos. So, so who, should, who should we support? I mean, someone's got to run the country. It's a big country. It's a significant country. Middle of Levant. It's a big deal. Who should run it? We should support anyone that doesn't support attacking America. ISIL is attacking America. And Bashar Assad has used chemical weapons to attack his own people and also has allowed ISIL to grow because he's a motivating force for them. And then they're able to attack America. But we don't have to solve every problem in the world. Well, I'm I don't just know. You, out that Russia you brought, you brought is not it up. Our friend. 
You brought it up. You said they're not our friend because they support Bashar al-Assad in Syria, which is a place most people couldn't find on the map. And my question is, if you disapprove of that, then who should run Syria? Since, I don't know, it's obviously yeah. of interest to you. Yeah, it, there's a lot of problems in the world right now, Tucker. I'm focused <laughs> on the country that attacked us, and I think okay. having an independent commission would help us get to the bottom of that. All right. Congressman, thanks a lot for coming on. Yeah, like thank your you, website. Tucker. Up next, more on that news tonight. President Trump's 2005 tax returns have been leaked. Keep you updated on the developments as we get them. Multiple times tonight and last night and for the past three months, there is very little substance at the heart of the Russian conspiracy story. Yet that hasn't stopped the press and a lot of politicians from building an entire James Bond film inside their heads. Senator James Lankford serves on the Senate Intelligence Committee. He's actually seen classified information related to the Russia investigation. He said he's fed up with, fed up with these myths. Senator Lankford joins us now. Senator, thanks for coming on. Yeah, glad to be so with you. So there's a lot about the story that I find confusing, but the one thing I understand is the core of the story, which is Russia affected the outcome of the 2016 election. Is there any evidence to suggest that's true? No. In fact, no one legitimately makes that accusation that if it wasn't for the Russians, then Hillary Clinton would be president. Uh, but it still seems to come up over and over again. And quite frankly, the more the Democratic Party runs with that, uh, I think it only helps Republicans because that means they're not dealing with their policies, that it's not dealing with all the things that were the real reasons that Americans didn't vote Democratic this, this last time they voted That's for the way Republican. it seems to me. And I never have thought Russia wishes us well. And I'm sure they cause all well, the they mischief don't. they're capable of causing us. And not defense of Russia. Right. But as an explanation, I've always thought it was bizarre. My question is someone who works with Democrats, doubtless you're friends with Democrats, you're yeah. a senator. Do they really believe it? Well, I think some do. I think some have this sense that it's Jim Comey's and the Russians' fault right. is the reason that Donald Trump is president. And the more they can raise the, the Russia issue, uh, the more they can try to delegitimize the Trump presidency. Uh, and they're trying to put two things together. Uh, one is there's solid evidence that the Russians were engaged in trying to be able to affect our outcome. And it's not just the outcome of the election, just elections, period. Right. If you go through all through Eastern Europe, they're trying to destabilize every democracy right. there. They feel like it helps them. Uh, if they push others down. It's no different than a seventh grade bully uh, making fun of every other kid saying I can elevate myself if I can try to push everyone else down. So they're constantly trying to attack and destabilize every democracy. It's the reason Putin brought in a big dog with him uh, when he's meeting with Angela Merkel right. because he heard that she was afraid of dogs and so he wanted to bring a big dog. That's just the kind of the nature of what Putin does is try to intimidate, destabilize, delegitimize. I don't think they were after the outcome of the election. They were just trying to delegitimize the election anyway. They They've can. been doing this for a hundred years since the Bolsheviks came. They they spread the lie that the moon landing was fake. Well, they that had, AIDS was created in American labs. I mean, this is there's a lot sure. of that's been going on. They had a KGB agent playing in the middle of the Jimmy Carter campaign. I mean, th this has been something they've done for a very long time. It was just a lot more overt this time. So you've got that issue that's resolved. The second part of it is the big leap. And that's what the Intelligence Committee has to be able to dig into all the information to be able to get out. And let's actually get hard facts. Was someone in the Trump campaign communicating with the Russians, coordinating with the Russians. The accusations are out there. It's already out there on the tax return issues for Donald Trump constantly. Let's get his tax returns to find out if there's some secret money moving back right. and forth between Russia or whatever it may be. So this is this constant diatribe that they're trying to run with. Let's get the facts on that. And let's separate the difference between where the Russians trying to engage in destabilizing. Yes, they do a lot of places, but well, let's get the facts out on the rest now, of the Now, I know you didn't see the MSNBC segment tonight, most likely, but was that tax return paid in rubles and did Vladimir Putin sign it? Do you well, the, the, the concern that I have is that uh, he not only had major investments in Russia, but they, uh, Donald Trump also has paid for his moon landing also with his tax return from 2005. It's just, it's bizarre to me. Well, especially point. since there are things it seems to me you could criticize this young administration on, legitimate criticism. Sure. And there also has got to be some form of like useful soul searching when you lose, but they don't seem to be engaged. Do you know any Democrats who are thinking, well, maybe we should get middle of the country to vote for us? Right. Maybe we should engage in reaching out on different policies and different set right. of ideas. And again, that, that, that's what, that's that what parties do. No, I don't. But that's what parties talk about. That's what individuals talk right. about. As funny as it is, you go back four years ago after Mitt Romney uh, lost. Uh, there was this big soul searching among Republicans. They created a list of about 20 things right. and said, if we want to win again, we got to do these 20 things. Donald Trump did zero of those 20, <laughs> and he won anyway. It all turned out to be wrong, oh, but yeah. whatever, and, at least and they so, tried. But that's what parties do on that. That's all right. <laughs> good point. Senator, great to see you. Good to see you again Thanks. as well. Up ahead, more insights, breaking news. The release of President Trump's 2005 tax returns, or a couple pages of it anyway. Speaking of President Trump, will be with him tomorrow for an interview that, that will air tomorrow at night at 9. So tune into that. We'll be right back. Well, 
Well, President Trump's 2005 tax return has been leaked to the press. He paid about $38 million on about $150 million in income. That's about 25% effective federal tax rate. So it seems kind of low to those of us who are paying more than that. But here's some perspective on this. We did a little math in the commercial break. President Obama in 2015 in his federal taxes paid 19.6. So that's a lot less. Now, Senator Bernie Sanders, who thinks everybody ought to pay way more taxes because the rich are shafting the rest of us, what did he pay? 2014, Bernie Sanders paid an effective tax rate of 13.5. That's more than 10 percentage points lower than Trump paid in 2005. What does it all mean? I don't know. Trace Gallagher is here to figure it out. Trace? And we just heard from the journalist who actually obtained the tax returns, the two pages. They were put into his mailbox. He thinks they might have been put there by the Trump administration. He says his big reveal is that Donald Trump paid $31 million in alternative minimum tax, which he's against. He said without that, he would have only paid like $5 million. This was a lot of hype, very little content, and the viewers did not like it. Some tweeting, is Rachel Maddow filibustering her own show? Another saying, why won't Rachel Maddow release Donald Trump's tax returns? What is she hiding? Very little information coming out of those returns. <laughs> He's paid a lot more in taxes than Bernie Sanders, though. How hilarious is that? <laughs> Trace, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. We'll be right back. Just a minute. We're hitting the road bright and early tomorrow to interview President Trump. We'll be showing that to you tomorrow night at 9, so don't miss it. You go to our Facebook page, TCT, send us your questions. Sean Hannity is standing by tonight. Don't miss that. See you tomorrow.